Wall Street Business Network. Are you one of the 9 million Floridians living in a community managed by a property manager or HOA? If you've ever wondered what your rights are as a resident or what your role is as a volunteer board member, you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Condo Coaches, your resource for when your gated community starts to feel more like you're stuck behind bars or when that guy next door decides that a hot pink Chevy on cinder blocks really sets the tone for the neighborhood. The Condo Coaches is brought to you by LMFunding.com. Find the Condo Coaches online at thecondocoaches.com. And now your host, Johnny Torres. Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. The Condo Coaches radio show coming to you from anywhere and everywhere you want to listen to us. We bring you experts and then, of course, our own expertise as we volunteer every week for you to help you run your community or homeowner association effectively, efficiently, and on budget. And when you don't, we bring in guys like our guest for today, <laughs> who I'll get you, who I'll get to in just a minute. Uh, and, and with me as always, head coach Dean Akers. How are you, sir? Good, Johnny. How are you doing? Doing great. You know, had a nice quiet weekend, so no complaints here. Yourself? Hey, I had a good weekend. I, um, I we cooked out and just uh, enjoyed life. Nice. Well, always a great weekend when you can live in Florida, right? And uh, with us today, uh, Mister uh, John Burpee. And uh, as I said, when you don't do the things you're supposed to be doing as a board member of your community or homeowner association or condominium association, uh, then that's when you get to meet guys like John Burpee. Uh, you now, uh, what, what's the official title for what you do? I'm the guy you don't want to see. That's right. <laughs> you're the title that you never want to hear. Uh, uh, I'm a court-appointed receiver. Um, court appointed receiver correct. got it okay and then that's what we're going to be talking about today receivership with your condominium or homeowner association this is more of a condo thing really than an hoa thing right uh, i mean do, does it ever happen in single family home communities or town oh yeah yep. it does okay yeah, wherever there's an hoa uh, association uh, it, it has the ability to go into receivership got it all right and i think the thing that why i'm so excited about having john on the show today is he's the guy you don't want to see, That's obviously. Right. <clears throat> but I think the things he's going to share, some of the tips of why they end up having to see him, right. are going to be invaluable to the boards out there and even the property owners to make sure that they're doing the things John has shared with me over the last six months of things that if board would just do them, he'd be, he'd be like the Maytag repair guy. He right. wouldn't have a job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But he doesn't have to worry about that because they managed to... Keep him plenty busy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, before we do that, we're going to open our shows. We do every week with the emails and messages we get through our social media platforms and our email address. Now, if you want to send your issue in, your question into the Condo Coach is very easy to do so. You can uh, go to our website, and that's a great way to get a hold of us. There's a few forms on there where you can contact us. That's thecondocoaches.com, thecondocoaches.com. Second, of course, is our phone number. Also a great way to get a hold of us if you want to leave us a message. And uh, Dean and the condo coaches will plug you in with the coach that's best suited not only to answer your question but to also help you resolve your issue. Our email address is help at thecondocoaches.com, help at thecondocoaches.com. And then, of course, our phone number. Our phone number also, if you want to call in, leave a message, that also gets you into the Condo Coaches Network. And we put that message and that phone number in the right hands to make sure that, again, we can help you move your issue or get your answered quick, uh, uh, get your question answered as quickly as possible. Our phone number, 813-331-5415, 813-331-5415. Uh, quick email here from Susan over in Lake Wales. She says, what radio stations are your broadcasts on and what time? Uh, she said she could find our website, you know, but she wasn't able to find a radio station near her. Well, that's exactly why we stream this show live on Facebook, because we can obviously reach people not only across the country, but also around the world by doing this type of program here. Uh, we are proud to have a strong list of four radio stations, actually five radio stations, across the state of Florida that carry the show. One, which is going to be changing, I think, over in the next few weeks or so, but uh, we are on AM860 WGUL. Um, that's right here in the Tampa Bay area where we originate the show. Uh, AM 1230, and that's going to be the one changing. That's going to switch over to WJNO. And I apologize, I don't have the, the, the 
position on the dial for that station. But uh, W, if you're living in the Palm Beaches, you know WJNL. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a big a, station. It's a flagship down there. It's going to be a huge <laughs> radio station. This show will absolutely blow up uh, following that format change down in the Palm Beaches. Um, and then we're in Orlando on AM 660 and 105.5 FM, The Answer, in Orlando. And we're on there on Sundays at 3 o'clock. And then down in Miami, AM 880, The Biz, and that's on Saturdays at 9 a.m. So those great radio stations, not only can you listen to them if you are in those markets, but you can also listen to them on the iHeartRadio app on any of those radio stations. So if you miss it once, you can catch it the next airing on the next station, on the next city, you know, that sort of thing. But the great thing is, is that we also put the show out in a podcast format on iTunes, which you can subscribe to, and we highly recommend that you subscribe to it on SoundCloud, Stitcher, a lot of the podcasting platforms. You can find the Conda Coaches on there, and we highly encourage you, as I said, to subscribe so that way you don't miss an episode. And you can also go back and listen to all these episodes because, really, the value and the the integrity of that information doesn't change right uh you know and when it does change we obviously keep you updated here on the show as well um scrolling down to another email here from pat wozniak uh pat seems to be down in the kind of the uh, southern part of the tampa bay area sarasota area she says we have a management company that takes the meeting takes the <coughs> minutes of their board meetings can the board tape those minutes also? In other words, can you record the meetings, be it on an audio device or a video device? Uh, Dean, what's your call on that? Well, again, as a condo coach, not as a lawyer, but as a right. condo coach, which we've had enough lawyers on here answer this, the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. And anybody can record it. Uh, right. Anybody. And then, you know, you would hope that obviously the board is proactive in providing those. Well, it, whether but, they are or they aren't, what well, the big thing is, is a lot of boards, uh, they they don't even know what they said in the meeting. And so the minutes, true. and most of the and minutes in a board meeting are for actions taken. So some people go, I have, I'll have listeners call it and they'll go, well, Dean, our board talked about we were going to have birds flying. Well, there was no action taken. So it's not really required to be in the minutes that it says, we talked about birds flying. And that's an important note yeah, because I think people important. underestimate exactly the role of not only the secretary, but also how that the, the minutes, for instance, are supposed to be executed. And you're saying that they don't have to document every single thing that happens during the meeting, only when actions are taken. Correct. In other words, it's, it's the official minutes of the meeting for actions that were taken. It doesn't matter where if Susie got up to get a bottle of water and everybody goes, hey, Susie, sit down. They don't yeah. have to put in the minutes. We told Susie to sit down because she got a bottle of water. Now, if a resident came up, asked a question, there was an engagement there between the resident and the board, is that something that should be documented? Uh, it, it's not required yeah. as a coach, It's but is it good protocol to put bullets of things that come up so that you can refer back later? Uh, uh, yes. And in fact, we're doing the continuing education program across the state now for uh the day in the life of a board member and again johnny without beating a dead horse but i'm gonna beat that dead horse what's the <laughs> number one thing that we get calls on where there are problems communication it's communication that's right there's just absolutely no reason for a board to be rude to its homeowners is there john well we put transparency into that yeah. communication box right. yeah. yeah but you'll see boards they'll, they'll tell a person that lives there you must submit a certified copy of a letter requesting yeah. this right like a budget you know just no give them the pdf right. yeah, yeah. Well, and, well and a lot of times you know what we've seen as well is uh hoas are now adopting a much more open approach and by publishing everything on their websites yeah. and or uh you know direct mailing uh minutes of the meetings to everyone that's uh that is a, a unit owner at the properties well, and that actually leads me right into my next question. And again, it kind of leads back to the board kind of making more trouble for themselves than they really should. Uh, Fabio, <laughs> you know, Fabio writes to us. From, I didn't mean to laugh. <laughs> but they do. I mean, we hear this all the time. I mean, it's like, how, how easy is it to just hand over what they're looking for or asking for? I mean, again, we're not dealing with top secret government information here. No. And so they make more problems for themselves than they really need to have. Generally. Right. So Fabio from Miami writes us uh, uh, in the Doral area. That's uh, 
uh, you know, my hometown down there in Miami, but uh, they always keep it interesting down there, of course. Uh, he says he filled out request forms for documents uh, from the association, and he says what's happened in the past is that the association will then grant uh, the permission to the owners to look through the records in about 52 boxes that are filled with old and irrelevant documents. <laughs> And then at the end, they aren't able to deliver on the documents that were requested in the first place. Well, if, if the documents are required to be stored or they're, they're required, you know, there's statutes of what how time they have to keep the different documents, yeah. then they just need to call, I guess, what, the DPR or something? Correct. Yeah, call it a beeper, uh, and the beeper will get involved. They'll issue, a, they'll issue a letter basically stating that they have to comply with the with the request. Yeah, and for those of you listening and for Fabio, that's the Division of Business and Professional Regulation. Uh, they are a state entity, and if you reach out to them, they'll help you out with this situation. You know what? 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years, let's stretch it back, Yeah, where you have somebody even word processing documents, maybe. Today, when you can put PDFs up and store Absolutely. them, you could store a bajillion amounts of records on a USB stick. Sure. I mean, so... Right. So there's no reason at all to make this difficult to get information for residents that are paying their fees, doing their deal. There's just no reason. No, or any of these free online storage accounts. Even, yeah, free. There's just so, there's there's a thousand reasons that there should communicate. Yeah. And zero why they shouldn't. All right. So, Fabio, there you go. I hope that helps a little bit. Obviously, again, there's another board making it more difficult for themselves than it needs to be because now he's going to get the DVPR involved, and uh, that's never a fun situation either. So. Well, and it's back to the transparency. If yeah. you try to hide, people think you're hiding. That's right. Well, John Burpee, receiver to that's the me. stars. <laughs> now, <laughs> we're going to talk receivership here yeah. with associations and, of course, head coach Dean Akers with me. As always, in uh, the beginning of the next segment, I'm going to talk to you uh, real quickly about our playbooks because these are going like wildfire online right now. We're getting tons of requests for these and downloads on our website right now. Uh, but what exactly are they and how can they help you? Well, that's what I'm going to tell you in the next segment. Stick around. We'll be right back. It's the Condo Coaches Radio Show. Want to call in with your issue? 813-331-5415. We'll be right back. Contact the Condo Coaches online at thecondocoaches.com. More of the Condo Coaches is coming up next. Attention men under the age of 35. You know what really impresses the ladies? When a guy has a few drinks and later gets pulled over for buzz driving. That could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. There goes let's grab dinner and a movie. Oh, I know. You drive more carefully when you're buzzed. You've proven that hundreds of times. A woman admires that kind of confidence. And you've practiced how to speak if a cop does pull you over. Slowly, clearly, and politely like, good evening, officer. A woman admires that kind of foresight. And what woman doesn't find it adorable that you call it buzzed even though the law calls it drunk? You could kiss $10,000 goodbye, along with any chance of having a girlfriend. Because nothing says, I'm a catch, more than a guy who lives in his parents' basement and calls it my place. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome back to The Condo Coaches, online at thecondocoaches.com. Here's your host, Johnny Torres. Thank you once again for listening. Again, you can catch every episode of The Condo Coaches on our website, thecondocoaches.com. You can also go to Facebook or YouTube. Just search The Condo Coaches. We've got 33, and with today's episode, 34 episodes there for you to digest with all kinds of issues that your homeowners or condominium association could be facing. And then, of course, we talk to you all about how the condo coaches are able to help you in these situations, and we love to do that. Um, I, I got an email from Facebook last week, which I thought was cool. Yeah. <laughs> We've surpassed the million impressions point. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's, that's really incredible. Yeah. You know, and especially. Yeah. Yeah. Big I mean, number. you know, this is a project that, you know, <laughs> we, we started legitimately from scratch. The brand, everything, the show started, uh, you know, just under a year ago. We're, we're closing in on a year now. And the, the response has been 
unbelievable. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, I know Dean's trying to keep up, you know, with the, with the growth of the show and we're starting to roll out, you know, some workshops and seminars and things like that, which we'll be giving out more details as those things come up. But, uh, it just goes to show you, as I'm sure you well know firsthand, how valuable it is for people to have this kind of information at their disposal, because most of them really have no idea what they've gotten themselves into. Yeah, can, I sh- can, can I share something else too, that is another, what I feel really proud of. We now can say we have a market coordinator in every market volunteer. So if there's somebody out there that goes, I got this question, I got this. We have a coordinator that's volunteering in the market to get the resources out of that area. So yeah. if they're in West Palm, that person can get a, a reserve person kit. We we didn't have that when we started out. Now we have right. volunteers that are spending time helping these associations. Well, and again, uh, for our friends out in Lake Wales, you know, who uh, who are obviously trying to get their hands on this information and get get more informed about how to run their associations, you know, we'll come out there to Lake Wales and Absolutely. we'll have somebody to, you know, find somebody to come out there and work with you if there's a particular number of issues you're dealing with. Sometimes we can solve these over the phone or right. over email, uh, but if you would like someone to come out to your community, that's something we'd be open to as well. Just feel free to reach out to us and you can do that again uh, via email, help at thecondocoaches.com, help at thecondocoaches.com, or you can give us a call. 813-331-5415. Um, getting back to, again, I think a, a, a hu- semi-humorous, but really, I mean, it's a, it's a big issue with, you know, these boards creating more problems for themselves than they need to be. I just wanted to touch on this email real quick. Not not that there's a lot of back and forth needed for it, but Amy writes to it. She says that she's a, a condo owner and she's asking whether it's all right for the board members to hold meetings with their backs towards the homeowner. <laughs> <laughs> i don't mean to uh, laugh oh my gosh yeah i saw that and i said why why not let's just make it as difficult as you can to yeah. create harmony in an uh, uh, association isn't that the face for radio joke and right that, that goes back that way yeah I think it does uh you but, know but dean was too pretty so we had to put in the live streaming here on facebook <laughs> had to call me in for backup exactly yeah, of we got john on today he's a uh, we always bring these handsome guys on like it. <laughs> ratings man you hit upon something earlier uh johnny that you, you know is that a lot of the boards that get into or a lot of the individuals that get into and sit on boards today really don't have a lot of the background that it takes to run an organization of this sort and right. this is this has always been the issue that i found being appointed by the courts and when i get appointed is that it's almost like it's an educational scenario the same way the condo coaches are doing for the, the general public yeah in that most people don't understand that HOAs are a business and that business has to make a profit or at least break even and everybody hopes to at least break even. Um, What we found over the years is that they're very personal in their nature and that's my neighbor and I don't want to put my neighbor on the street and I don't want to hurt my neighbor but at the same time they fail to recognize that the bottom line has to be addressed and that's where I come in as the as the receiver for the property is it hope that it never gets to that point, but the court has recognized that, hey, either the board, it does not or has not the capability of being able to do what needs to be done, and they bring me in to make the the tough decisions. Well, and for those of you just tuning in, uh, John Burpee is with us. He is a receiver, typically appointed by the state to come in and uh, and work out the issues in an association, be that condominium, homeowner association. Uh, But again, you know, if if you're not reaching out to the condo coaches to come out and help you with your issues, you end up with a guy like John, and and that's <laughs> never a good that's never a good situation. And again, it's it's one of these things where they're they're they take it personal, right? right? And you have to take the personal element out of it. We get emails all the time saying, "Hey, I've got this issue, but my neighbor is one of the people that's doing what's <laughs> wrong here," and you know, I, they, it kind of puts them in a tough spot. Because they feel like, you know, the people that, that they befriended in their community are some of the same people causing the problems. One of, one of the big issues that we always bring up when we, when we sit down and we talk to boards is that someone ultimately is going to pay. And if you've got a situation where you've got maybe 5 or 10% of a total community that's not paying their portion of the bill, that bill is being offset by the remaining 90, 95% of that, that property. That's so right. Money's got to come from somewhere. Essentially, you're supporting that 5% or 10% yeah. that are not paying. Right. And, you know, that, that 
when you open their eyes to that situation and realize you put a monetary value on it, that's when things start to change. Uh, now, Dean, real quick, just to get back to this email, because she says, in addition to this board meeting taking place where the board doesn't even face their homeowners, uh, they're apparently also starting the meeting before the residents even get there. So they'll tell them the meeting starts at 7. Meanwhile, they're getting there 6 or 6.30 and having a meeting before the residents even come into the room. And so is there anything the residents can do in that kind of a situation where they feel like maybe the board's not being as transparent as they should be? Well, there's a there's a one provision that uh, that if a board is discussing private matters of the association collections legal, right. they can have an assembly for that reason. But they still need to say they're having a board meeting, but it's closed because of. Right. You can have a closed board meeting and you can have an open meeting. And a lot of times I, I actually sit as a president of a, a local board okay. and we'll have our closed meeting prior to the open meeting. It just makes it for convenience that the board directors are going to be there anyway, so you right. might as well kill two birds at one stone. But but so they are allowed to have those closed board meetings when yeah. they're speaking on very private information or yeah. or that's a correct. personal situation. That's but correct. again, again, a board should be transparent. And say that's a closed meeting because that's why it's closed. That's yeah. correct. They don't need to go none of your business. And then the other thing is, is I would say, and John, my friend here, is on a board. Uh, do you think it would be good decorum to put your back to the residents. <laughs> I, I could, I could only imagine that meeting and how that would go down if I was sitting on the board of that, yeah. you know, uh, that's, that's just, that's asking for trouble. Yeah. Well, again, it just sends the completely wrong message there. And, uh, and, and again, it's them making the more problems for themselves than, than they need to. Um, and obviously they're bothered enough by it to reach out to us. So, to well, that. yeah. And people don't realize uh, it's called a community for a reason because all those residents in there have a dog in the fight, so to speak. In fact, we were talking at lunch. That's he actually, yep. he doesn't have a dog in the fight when he comes in, but they all have a dog in the fight. And so, so the board is acting on behalf of everybody in there. So there's absolutely no reason not to be inclusive of information. Yeah. You, know, you, you guys have got a great name with the condo coaches because that's the way we look at it is it's a team effort. Right. And, and, you know, and the board is basically the coach for the team is, is all it is. And, and you engage all of your unit owners that have a vested interest and a financial interest in that property. If you take that approach, I think, you know, most of these boards will see that that team will come together and you can all win together at that point. Yeah. Well, again, thank you to everybody who wrote in or sent in their questions and issues, and feel free to do so at thecondocoaches.com. Again, joining us, John Burpee, who's a receiver for the state of Florida. Now, that falls under the DBPR? Uh, it does, but it's mostly a court action. It's mostly uh, okay. six, six cents will different court or whatever court that appoints me. Now, we've got a couple minutes here left in this segment, so let's kind of lay down the ground rules. Under what circumstances does a court come in and appoint a receiver? Usually it's on a foreclosure type of an action. If the HOA has fallen behind on their bills, if they have an outstanding loan, uh, if a bulk portion of the property is owned by a, uh, a original developer, um, and such as like back in 2008 and nine during the financial crisis, you had a lot of condo conversions or new condos that the developer basically walked away. Well, the lender or whoever it would be would then install me as the prop uh, as the property receiver. Um, so it was, so that's a more of a proactive approach, right? Correct. In that instance. Correct. You know, think, think of me as the guardian for the real estate is the easiest way to say it in layman's terms. Okay. Uh, the, the real estate in, in my position comes first and the quality and the care of the real estate comes first. That comes with a lot of hard decisions like we spoke about before, because there is a lot of human action, human interaction with regards to individual unit owners. Um, and in many cases, we've got to sit down and explain what our role is to unit owners when we come in. Several times in the past, I've come in and there has not even been a board in place when I've been appointed as the receivership. Well, we've been a little bit concerned about that being that there were obviously looking at term limits and, and of course, now increased yes. criminal penalties for board members. And of course, that's going to have an effect on already, uh, you know, again, an organization that typically find, it has a hard time finding people to volunteer for. And, and one of the things that just changed in the law, if you're talking about the July 1st law that just yep. went into effect, they've actually taken a little bit of my power away from me in that 
from a receiver standpoint, I can no longer vote with my shares of however many units that I represent. Wow. So it, for some reason, I don't understand why the legislature did that the way yeah. they did. And a lot of people believe that it's it's an oddball, but it is what it is. All right. John Burpee, receiver, head coach, Dean Akers, yours truly, Johnny Torres, talking receivership with Homeowners and Condominium Associations. It's the Condo Coaches Radio Show, segment three, coming up right after this. Contact the Condo Coaches online at thecondocoaches.com. More of the Condo Coaches is coming up next. It only takes a minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. And you can do it at doihaveprediabetes.org. But you're probably not going to. Nope. I'm sure you've got a perfectly good excuse. Kids, work. (laughs) I get it. You're busy. So what better time than now? Let's begin. Raise one finger if you're a man. Ladies, none yet. Oh, count in your head if you're driving. Now, three more fingers for everyone over 60, two over 50, one over 40, One more if you're not physically active. Another finger if anyone in your family has type 2 diabetes. Another if you've got high blood pressure. If you're overweight, raise another finger. Two if you're very overweight. And three if you're really overweight. You've just taken the world's first audio prediabetes test. And if you're holding up five or more fingers, visit doihaveprediabetes.org or talk to your doctor. There's no excuse because prediabetes can be reversed. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Welcome back to The Condo Coaches, online at thecondocoaches.com. Here's your host, Johnny Torres. We thank you so very much for listening. If you've never tuned into The Condo Coaches before, Again, we are a team of volunteers here lending our expertise to help you run your condominium or homeowner association effectively, efficiently, and on budget. And when you don't, you get to meet guys like our guest today, John Burpee, who is a receiver. So when these communities go into what is called receivership uh, based on a court judgment, right, then uh, you get appointed to come in and basically take the place of the board or a board member uh, to make sure that things are being done the right way. Correct. Uh, before we get back into the conversation, I just want to talk about, because I forgot to do it the last segment because we were having such a good time with all the emails that we got, but we have these six booklets. I mean, I'm going to need a, a whole nother suitcase <laughs> to carry just our booklets, but these are what we call our Condo Coaches Playbooks. And what we have created with these playbooks is a series of booklets with the information that is absolutely vital to you as a condominium board member, homeowner association board member, or even a resident. We get lots of people downloading these. They're going like wildfire right now. You can download them at our website, thecondocoaches.com slash playbook, thecondocoaches.com slash playbook. Now, why are they so popular? And Dean, you've already printed thousands of these. It's because this is really the foundation of what you need to know. And honestly, there there isn't out there. There isn't. This There's is nothing. your a condominium or homeowner association for dummies. And so we started off with the first book, the top 10 most important things you need to know if you're a condominium or an association board member. And then we have the the series continues with, again, the basics. So collecting delinquent association fees, which obviously falls into what we're talking a little bit about today with John Burpee, understanding your community's finances. Those two go hand in hand. And so, you know, these two are the absolute lifeblood of your community. And then the ABCs of holding elections, that's going to be very, very necessary soon. So we'll sh- we should see an uptick in those booklets. By the way, we have a guest coming on the last week in July mm-hmm. uh, to speak on uh, electronic elections. So that's going to be exciting. Oh, perfect. So definitely don't miss that show. Now, our two newest booklets are also a great way for you to, again, expand your knowledge on not only what's happening in your community, but also what happens in other boards. And so we have the five most common mistakes board directors make. Great, because again, while you may think your situation is completely unique to your community, more often than not, it, it isn't. And uh, and we see this all the time. We see this every day with all the questions and issues that we get. And then also, uh, this one would actually be perfect for that last email we got. Best practices for planning and executing successful association meetings. And number one on this book should be do not turn your back <laughs> to the homeowners in your association meeting. But we may have to make a revision to, to our booklet to tell people not to ignore their homeowners. How cool a graphic would that be? 
<laughs> oh my! It looks actually, you know, I imagine it being more like a New Yorker cartoon. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> where you know you got the board up there, and then you know the residents are all trying to figure out what's going on as they got their back turned. To well, them. what may be even more comical? I wonder if each one of them has like a rearview mirror, and they're sitting there, and they go. The board would like to recognize the girl in the green jacket that's in my rearview mirror. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, those booklets, absolutely free. And we do it because we love to help people out there. Again, that's the reason we volunteer, because if you're sitting on a board, you're volunteering as well. And then we know that you're spending hours upon hours every week to help your community run as best as possible. And that's why we put this information together because nobody else had. Right. And it's incredibly valuable out there. You know, if you want a hard copy, make sure you email Dean for the hard copies. That's help at the condo coaches.com help at the condo coaches.com. And we'll send you hard copies of these booklets. You just, we, we've given out, we've just eclipsed 5,000 copies, hard copies we've given out. Yeah. We're going to have to actually like team up with Amazon to, de- <laughs> no, to deliver these via a drone, you know, it, 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 you'll end up like shipping these in a box, you know, the size of a library. Well, I never envisioned that that many people would want the booklets mailed, which we do. And yeah. we have underwriters that pay for it. So it's not our, so uh, we have a, our, our initial, what we thought might be a little postage, whatever. <laughs> Just keep asking us. We'll yeah. keep shipping them. Right. I'm going to get a copy of those for myself. Oh uh, yeah. There you go. I can get you. <laughs> well, and, and we, we're finding, and shout out to all our property managers that are listening, we are finding that we have great property managers out there that see the value in these, and they are requesting them for the communities that they work with. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that we run into a lot is that even though the manager is uh, a, a uninterested third party between the board and the, uh, and the unit owners, uh, they're, they're still caught in a precarious situation sometimes and not knowing the intricate details of the law and, and how it relates to their individual property. Well, if a board so, is dysfunctional, that's absolutely going to affect their right. work with that community. Right. Uh, and so it's in their best interest as well to make sure that that board is running as, as efficiently as possible to make their job easier. And many times we'll bring in an uninterested third-party attorney that specializes in condo law yeah. when we get into those situations to explain to some of these boards that, look, this is not right. It's it's not what you're, you know, it's not the correct way to do it. So that it's coming from a third party, not from their property manager or not from me as a as a court appointed receiver, but from someone that has an uninterested uh, view of the situation. Well, and that's again, why I think people have responded so well to the show because we are that uninterested third party. And we do have a team of attorneys with the condo coaches that are ready to answer these questions in a way that again, is going to be very black and white and they have no, uh, you know, no skin in the game as Dean likes to say. And, you know, it's turned out to be a, a, a huge necessity out there. That, that we've certainly tapped into. John Burpee is a receiver. He's our guest coach for the day. We're talking about receivership in condominium or homeowners associations. Uh, I did ask you a question early on, and and I, I, I was a bit you know caught off guard by it. I thought this was kind of more of a condominium thing. You're saying it does if there's an association, it could fall into receivership. Absolutely. Yeah, and not only just not only just the associations, but foreclosure properties, uh, anything that is income producing um, during the heyday of the financial crisis 2008 9 10 we were busier than we ever were obviously because any property that has an income stream tied to it uh, a lender would file on a foreclosure and immediately move for a receiver to be put into place and most people say well why would you do that in that you've got to protect that income stream and many times there was enough money to make the mortgage payments but for some reason personal whatever it may be the owner of the property just chose not to make those payments and therefore that income was going somewhere else. Now, it's not to say that's every case, but during that period of time, a lot of individuals were living off of that money that was coming in and just not making mortgage payments because they knew that their property was upside down in value. They were going to lose it anyways. Sure. So the lender uh, uh, and the courts essentially put us into place as to protect that property. And again, we become the guardian of the real estate, the guardian of the of the cash flow, the guardian of the of the income stream, and your only obligation there is to follow the governing documents, uh, which uh, are held by that community. That's correct. That and the Florida statutes. Okay. Yep, that's correct. Now, is it always financial when you're brought into a situation like that? No. In fact, Dean and I were talking about this at lunch. I've got one of the most unique receiverships I've ever had in my in my 20 plus year career. I got brought into a situation where we've got two individuals that own multiple pieces of real estate together 
one of the individuals operates a business out of those out of those properties. Well, the business unfortunately has taken a downturn, can't afford to pay rent, and but their governing agreements state that it's a 50-50 decision on everything that they do. Well, they've been deadlocked for a year. No one has paid rent, so the court has brought me in to basically be the deadlock breaker. Uh, wow. I make the decision for the real estate. I make the decision for and always what's in what's happening. in the best interest for the real estate. Absolutely, we're the guardian of the real estate. Got it. Yep. And it's interesting the outcome on this because he 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 made the hard decision that should have been made, but he was able to vacate a situation that right. that would have not been able to have happened without you. Yeah, we had a business that was basically not paying rent for many many months. I think actually a couple of years. And the first thing we did was file for eviction of that business. So we'll move that business out, re-rent the property, and get a cash flow stream going for that property. Even though the business was owned by one of the owners of the that's actual correct. property. That's correct. Yeah, that's yep. real. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that gets real complex real quick. <laughs> Holy cow. And you, and you can only imagine, you know, we, we were called in on the largest uh, fractured condo deal. This was back in 09, 010, mm-hmm. um, which was 1,000 units here in the Tampa Bay area. Wow. Uh, I don't want to name names, but it was the largest, it was the largest fractured foreclosure in this market. And I was appointed the receiver and you can imagine times that by a thousand of the complications that go along with, yeah. you know, individuals writing leases for a dollar, uh, individuals putting their family members into units without leases, um, you know, things like that that go along with, uh, with the property. Well, and this is the thing. I, it's one of those situations where I don't think that a resident ever thinks that something like this could happen. No. They don't think that their association could go into foreclosure, could right. go into bankruptcy. Uh, and and so oftentimes, you know, that's why I'm, I'm naturally a very fiscally conservative person. And when all of a sudden people are like, oh, we want a pool, we want an amenity center, we wanted this, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I was like, let's kind of uh, roll that tape back a little bit because, again, the, the the ramifications, the effect of this on everybody as a whole, you know, are, are pretty severe. I mean, right. we don't know, you know, whether it's someone that's barely just getting by, you know, and again, when you're talking about a pool or an amenity center or something like that, it's not just the cost of putting it in there. Then it's the ongoing cost for the life of that uh, amenity Correct. to maintain it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So the cost is never what people think it's going to be and and one of you know a lot of things that we we find also is the overlooked items that people never see the infrastructure underneath the property right you know a lot of the properties in this area right now are coming up on 40 50 60 years old a lot of that black pipe that was put into place the clay pipe all the sewer lines are breaking down all the infrastructure lines are breaking down all the stormwater sewer lines are breaking down and, you know, we've got a situation now at a property that I'm involved in. We're talking about a million dollars that has to come up with overnight to yeah. fix some of these items. So on a, you know, if you take a, a 200 unit property, you come up with a million dollars, you have to do a special assessment of $5,000 per unit, you know, on, on a property that's maybe worth seventy five, eighty thousand $80,000 per unit. That's a big number. Yeah, that's a know. huge chunk of change. And again, yeah. most of the communities that we deal with, Florida just being what it is, you know, the the people who live there may be on a fixed income. Absolutely. And Absolutely. and that's why we've also taken a more proactive approach by bringing in bankers and people that are in that those kind of financial institutions that ha- are a little more creative as to how to structure those assessments so that it can be affordable to move that community forward. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, it, it all depends – this goes back to exactly what you guys are, are teaching on a daily basis. It all depends on the financial health of the HOA. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get a loan if you've got 25% vacant or 25% past due. You've, you're not going to get a loan if your collections aren't in line. You're not going to get a loan if, you're, if your budget hasn't been passed for the last three years, yeah. if you don't have reserves you know, of some sort of reserve. Well, so that's, that's one of the things that the condo coaches helps out with. We'll actually talk a little bit about that financial assessment that we do at the beginning of the next segment. It's the Condo Coaches Radio Show. Again, thank you so much for listening. To learn more, check out thecondocoaches.com. Final segment, up next. Contact the Condo Coaches online at thecondocoaches.com. More of the Condo Coaches is coming up next. Life is full of bittersweet transitions. It's difficult to know how these changes will impact us over time. For some people, difficult transitions like retirement, divorce, 
or loss of a loved one can hit harder than expected and may contribute to feelings of hopelessness or even thoughts of suicide. The risk of suicide is even higher for men over 50 who served our country. Guys like me. That's why support from friends and family makes such a big difference. Every day, your actions could help save a life. Together, we got this. Learn how you can help save a life at VeteransCrisisLine.net. Welcome back to The Condo Coaches, online at thecondocoaches.com. Here's your host, Johnny Torres. Thank you, as always, for listening. It's our final segment. We are talking receivership with John Burpee, our guest coach and head coach, Dean Akers. Uh, just before the end of the last segment, I did uh, you know, want to bring up the fact that uh, you know, we have these books, right, that are obviously a big help to everybody, and you can get those at thecondocoaches.com slash playbook. Um, but also, one of the services, or, or one of the many services that we do as the condo coaches is a number of assessments. Really, we can do an assessment for just about every type of expert we've had on the show. Yeah. Uh, and so, whether it comes down to infrastructure, whether it comes down to uh, insurance, whether it comes down to natural disasters, uh, or even, as we were talking at the end of the segment, uh, financial situation. It's, it's, it's probably been the most sought-after service that the condo coaches provides, completely free of charge. It's a financial assessment of your community, and the condo coaches come in, and we have all kinds of magic and, and voodoo that uh, Dean Nakers likes to do with numbers and spreadsheets. Tell us a little bit about, Dean, you know, how that works, and, and obviously how can people can take advantage of it. Well, we have the associations. They send in their year-ends, two, two separate year-ends, and then their year-to-dates. We have a group that puts them in a spreadsheet, and then we have some experts that analyze them. And we come back with what I call, John and I talked at lunch, we don't have a dog in the fight. And we come back with business recommendations, not emotional. And then he brought an interesting thing at lunch that has escaped me since I've been in the business. But the management companies cannot offer advice financially and or legally. Interesting. So Correct. so they're kind of like okay. not providing it, but really can't. And I'm, I sat there at lunch and I had a light bulb moment saying, well, the condo coaches can. Right. And we have coaches that do the finance. We have coaches that are legal. So I would really encourage the associations now to take advantage of that. They can send it to us at the help at thecondocoaches.com. And we have a team that's going to give them a financial overview. And we've helped several associations now get loans that had been previously turned down by putting our condo coach loan packages together with their help. Yeah, and again, it, I think it's been a much more efficient way and uh, economical way to get the, the the finances that the community needs to kind of help it move forward so whether it's to kind of catch up on bills or whether it's to make improvements or whether it's you know new features and things that they want to add to the community i think the impact is far less uh impactful you know than than doing an assessment and saying hey everybody needs to write us well, yeah. one, one of the things you could look at this way it's almost like getting a free audit right uh, you know and that's that's the benefit of it and especially yeah. with me as a receiver when I come in, the community is usually strapped for cash to begin with, and you know they've been putting this off for a long time. And you know, Dean and, and LM Funding and, and the, the groups there, they're able to offer that uninterested third-party audit that gives you the ability to go in and look at the balance sheet and look at the receivables yeah. and get a good handle on where the, the, the trajectory of the HOA is going. Well, and on that same note, then, you know, uh, you know, to all the property management companies that are listening, you know, we'd be more than happy to come out. You know, you just let us know where we need to show up if they are not able to provide that type of guidance. Again, that's something that's within the boundaries of the condo. Coaches. Well, and, and, and to John's point, we were talking earlier when we give an assessment, I've, I've shared with him. I've seen people that are he's just like the guy of death sitting there. He just <laughs> these associations that some of that them far, Dean, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but some of the associations I've seen, they, they're just a, a one foot from having a John yeah. Burpee come in, and they don't know it. Yeah. And I think that's a sad thing. And that, that, we see that a lot. You know, once once they once they cross the line, there's really no going back because someone mm -hmm. has taken legal action to put me in that place to correct a problem that realistically nine times out of 10 could have been corrected should, if the board would have done what they 
should have done to begin right. with, and that is put the property first. And taking the so. personal element out of it, taking the Correct. emotional element out Correct. of it. You know, it, like I got back, I spoke about this earlier, is that I walk into a lot of situations where, you know, a lot of these boards have multi-million dollar budgets. Yeah. And if you don't have that background and that training to understand how to read a balance sheet and how to read an income statement, how to do your projections on what amount of deficiency you're going to have over the course of years going forward, it's it'll get away from you very quickly. Well, I think even in your smallest community, and Dean might agree, is is that I, I think that's overwhelming to some people. It is. They get in there wanting to do the right thing, and they want to contribute their time and their efforts, and then they get in there and realize what they're truly working with and right. what they are truly responsible for. And I think some people get overwhelmed, and possibly that's why some of them maybe just aren't able to handle the roles that they've taken on. Well, they look for they, they look for then look back to their management company for advice and direction. And unfortunately, yeah. due to stat, state statutes, that, that management company isn't allowed to do that. They're not allowed to guide that board or offer advice. They can tell them what's legal. They can tell them that they can do this, this, and this, but they can't offer that advice that the condo coaches or someone like me in that capacity has the ability to do. So here's a question. Give us an idea of what is the perception of someone like you coming into an association versus the reality? In other words, I would imagine that people are just not not happy to see you. You're probably the most unpopular person in the room when you come into an association. In many cases, it's just the opposite because okay. the, the either, either the property has fallen into such disrepair that no one's done anything uh, over the course of two to three years, and it's financially defunct, and now I come in with the cure, so to speak, or sure. to do the right thing. And I'm the guy that makes the tough decisions. I'm the guy that does the special assessments. I'm the guy that gets the financial health and the well-being of the property put back into place. What we talked about before is we try to engage the unit owners, and many times the unit owners are the ones that petition to bring us in to begin with. Okay. Uh, you know, they know their community is failing. Right. But no one on the board level or no one at the senior level in management has made that decision to make the financial hardship a reality. Is that something the residents can do is request someone like you to they come can. in and, yes. and, and kind of take charge? Yep, they can. You know, I mean, obviously we provide guidance. We're more of in a consultant advisory mode in in regards to the condo coaches. But I would think, you know, a board is a board able to say, "Hey, we're going to come in and appoint you to kind of lead us in the right direction." Or not how does necessarily, that work? not without a legal action. Right. Okay, yeah, so there has to be a legal action. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. There has to be a legal action. In some cases, uh, there is, it's very rare that in a members of the association will file a, a suit against the board or anything along that lines. Very, very rare. It's happened, but very rare. You're better off with the condo coaches and bringing uninterested third party like them in. With me, it's more of a court action and either a lender or someone has forced a lien against the property. Uh, one time I had a situation where they did a very large capital improvement. Unfortunately, they didn't have the money to pay the bill brought forth the court action. They put wow. me in as a receivership because no one would do a special exception, a special assessment. Sure. And I was forced to take. Well, nobody back. wants to be the bad guy, right? And right. say, yeah, Hey, but, look. We, but he comes in, he's going to, he's the one thing when we met uh, a year ago, whatever, what I, what always impressed me about John was he's a strong business minded m person anyway, but he knows how to make those decisions and make those decisions that'll work. And he doesn't want to hear about all the blah, blah, blah. It's the decision. If you can't handle it, his responsibility, what do you call it? You're the guardian. And the guardian of real estate. And he that's his gig. And Come, coming down to the last couple minutes here of the show, uh, where do you see it typically going south? Like once you get in there and you've kind of diving into some of the history and you see some of the dynamics at work in that particular community, what's the trend that you see that, that may be some red flags for people to look for before they get to someone like you? Usually there's a very large CapEx item that needs to be funded and it just continues to be put on the back burner. I'm, I'm sorry, just break that down for me. CapEx? Roofs need to be replaced. Okay, got it. Uh, siding needs to be replaced. Plumbing needs to be, you know, we've been in situations where we've had to replumb the entire building because it had polybutylene piping in it or something along that lines, and it's just continuing to break and break and break. So in situations like that where you've got to go out and fund it to a couple of million dollars, uh, go out and get a loan or something along that lines, and unfortunately the boards just, some boards just don't have that capability of doing that. Well, and again, someone's just having that knowledge of to right. how exactly to execute on a project like that. Right. 
Which, again, is why I think, you know, again, we've had success with the show because yeah. we've been able to <clears throat> give people some direction and or at least certainly the opportunity to reach out to us when they've needed that sort of oh, help. We've given a couple of boards direction to the point they've gotten bank loads they couldn't have gotten before and they knew they did, couldn't got them. We reformatted it, put the loan package together, and they got bank loans. Do you typically do more than one community at a time? Or Yeah, pretty much. I mean, on average, right now, it's it's a little bit slower than what it was, but at the height of the market, I, 14, 15 uh, receiverships were wow. not uncommon. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for being on oh, the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you it. You know, it's uh, you any, any uh, parting words to our <laughs> – thank you. Any parting words to our associations out there and uh, – you know, uh, that, that again, maybe looking at being in this kind of a situation, you know, it, it's, it's do the right thing, you know, look yourself in, in, in the mirror every day. And if it's, if it's right for the property, that's really what's going to be the best thing to do. for the. Property. And that's the best approach, right? Is, is. is doing what's right for the property, not for your neighbor, not right. for yourself, not for, there's always going to be someone that can't afford it, unfortunately. Yeah. But in the overall, you know, it's it's better for the, the, the well-being of the property. All right. If you've missed a single episode of The Condo Coaches, all 34 of them, don't forget they are on Facebook and YouTube. Just search for The Condo Coaches. You can also find us online at thecondocoaches.com. Subscribe to us for our podcast version. Check out iTunes and SoundCloud. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to The Condo Coaches, brought to you by lmfunding.com. Find us online at thecondocoaches.com and join us this same time next week as we help you navigate life in your managed community.